In this video, we're going to take a look at the third API testing lab on Portsugger's Web Security Academy. The lab is called Exploiting a Mass Assignment Vulnerability. So I'm going to start by going through the background information for the lab. If you want to jump straight into it, you can skip to the appropriate video chapter. Mass Assignment, also known as Auto Binding, can inadvertently create hidden parameters. It occurs when software frameworks automatically bind request parameters to fields on an internal object. Mass assignment may therefore result in an application supporting parameters that were never intended to be processed by the developer. Since mass assignment creates parameters from object fields, you can often identify these hidden parameters by manually examining objects returned by the API. For example, consider a patch request to slash API slash users, which enables users to update their username and email and includes the following JSON. So it sends across the username and the email. And if you send a concurrent GET request to API slash user slash one, two, three, it returns the following. So it has an ID as well as the username and email. And it also has this is admin property, which is set to false. This may indicate that the hidden ID and is admin parameters are bound to the internal user object alongside the updated username and email parameters. To test whether you can modify the enumerated is admin parameter value, add it to the patch request. In addition, send a patch request with an invalid is admin parameter value. If the application behaves differently for each of these requests, it may suggest that the invalid value impacts the query logic, but the valid value doesn't. This may indicate that the parameter can be successfully updated by the user. You can then send a patch request with the is admin parameter set to true to try and exploit the vulnerability. If the is admin value in the request is bound to the user object without adequate validation and sanitation, the user wiener may be incorrectly granted admin privileges. To determine whether this is the case, you can browse the application as Wiener to see if you can access the admin functionality. All right, so let's take a look at the lab. The description says, to solve the lab, we must find and exploit a mass assignment vulnerability to buy a lightweight leet leather jacket. We've been given some credentials to log in with and we're told what knowledge we're required for the lab. So let's open it up. All right, let's start off with the functionality. I'm gonna to browse to one of the products. I'm gonna add it to the cart, and then I'm gonna have a look at Burp Suite and see do we have any API endpoints, but we don't. So what else can we do? Let's go to log into our account, and let's also update our email address. Let's have a look again at Burp and see do we have any calls to API, but we still don't. So let us see what else we can do. We can go to the cart, and we can place an order, add, remove, or place order. Let's click on place order. It says we don't have enough credit. Let's take a look at Burp again. And now finally we have post API slash checkout. That sends across this JSON object of chosen products with a product ID and a quantity. And it comes back saying insufficient funds, which we would expect because we've got zero store credit. So what can we do here? Well, one thing that we didn't do was check the API documentation again. Why don't we try and go to slash API? And actually this time we do have some Request. We've got a post request to check out and we can have a look at this and see what does it take. And notice we've got here a chosen discount. So you can tick that. It's optional. You can tick it and then you can put in a description, a discount ID and a percentage. So that's interesting. We could fill this in here and then we could just click send or we can do the curl request. But I like to do things in burp. So we'll go ahead and do that. We've also got the get request here, which returns an order. And that should actually come back with the discount ID. So let me go back to the lab home. Let's go back to our cart and let us try and just do, was it just a get request here? Let me see. Oh, it's the get request to API checkout. So whenever we do a get request to API checkout, it comes back with the chosen products and it also has the item price here. So we could try and modify the item price as well, but we'll probably want to try this first, the chosen discount, which is currently set to zero. Okay, so I'm going to take the post request that we made earlier to the checkout. Let's go here, send to the repeater, and we can go to add another item then to our JSON object. So let me change this. Let's say it's already got the chosen products. This is a list. As you can see here, we've got these square brackets. So we need to do it after here. We'll do a comma, and then we're doing a new object. So two curly braces, and then we're saying that the, what was it called? Discount? Chosen discount. So we're saying that the chosen discount is another object because remember this can have multiple parameters. It can have the percentage, it can have a description and things like that. But all we are really interested in is the percentage. Perhaps we'd put this in and it would come back and say, no, you need a description. In which case we just add a description, but let's give this a go. Okay, we got an error. So I've done something wrong with the formatting. 
I see that we are missing the semicolon here. So let's try that. And we get the same error. So, okay, we've got our list here of the chosen products. Maybe I should have done this using the tool or curl. Okay, I think I've got too many objects here. All right, so actually we've got one JSON object and then chosen products is a list of objects, but the chosen discount isn't a separate object. It's just part of the main object, I think. Let's see. Yeah, that looks good. All right, so it says the order was created. Let us go back to the homepage and see if we've solved the lab. We have. Well, since that was the final lab on API testing, it's now time to look at how we can prevent these vulnerabilities. Presumably they'll add more API labs in future. This is quite a new topic, so I'd expect there to be more than three in the future, which is going to kind of mess up this playlist, but oh well. So when designing APIs, we should make sure that security is a consideration from the beginning. In particular, we should make sure that we secure our documentation if we don't intend the API to be publicly accessible. Ensure documentation is kept up to date so that legitimate testers have full visibility of the API's attack surface. Apply an allow list of permitted HTTP methods. Validate that the content type is expected for each request or response. Use generic error messages to avoid giving away information that may be useful for an attacker. Use protective measures on all versions of your API, not just the current production version. To prevent mass assignment vulnerabilities, allow lists of properties that can be updated by the user and block list sensitive properties that shouldn't be updated by the user. Okay, I said that was the third and final API lab, but apparently it's not. It's kind of confusing the way this is done because if you look at the API testing section, it only has three labs in it. But then if you look at all the labs section, it has five. So, okay, we've done three of the labs. We did exploit an endpoint using documentation. We did an unused API endpoint and a mass assignment vulnerability. In the next video, we'll look at how to exploit server-side parameter pollution in a query string. And then we'll look at the expert lab on exploiting server-side parameter pollution in a REST URL. As usual, let me just recommend that you sign up to the Integrity platform if you want to find some API vulnerabilities and get paid for it. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.